Um, I think we are at 7 p.m. So let's get started if everyone is ready. I'm sure the others will be joining in as the other sessions wrap up. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had an interesting day and um, found the sessions over the course of the day to be engaging and informative. Our next plenary session is on a topic that all of us will agree, especially in today's environment, is absolutely the need of the hour. Compassionate economy for sustainable development. We have with us a very diverse panel of inspiring speakers. Nobel Peace Laureate Kailash Satyarthi, Gaurav Gupta from Dalberg, Anita Bhatia, Executive Director, Deputy Executive Director from UN Women. Uh, I would just like to recap a couple of logistics details. My colleagues Isha and Tanvi will be supporting the plenary. Uh, they will share the process for Q&A as well as other updates on the chat window. So please watch out for it. I would like to invite Gaurav to introduce the session as well as Kailash Satyarthi. Gaurav is the Asia Director of Dalberg, Dalberg Advisors. He advises clients on how to maximize social impact. Gaurav, over to you for what promises to be a really interesting session. Totally agree, and thanks so much for that intro. I'll make it quick because uh, Mr. Satyarthi's time is, is precious. So I, I just want to say that this session, all of you will have uh, attended many of the other sessions today and seen that one of the common themes across that is that this crisis is really making existing disparities and inequalities uh, even more so. Uh, it has exacerbated the challenges that many were facing already. And we're very fortunate to have a, a discussion today around how to address those existing and new vulnerabilities that have come up. And to really frame that discussion, there is no better person that I can think of than uh, Mr. Kailash Satyati, who is internationally acclaimed child rights activist, has been a tireless advocate of children's rights for, for four decades now. And his interventions have now spread over to 140 countries uh, in, in, the, in his endeavor to protect children from slavery, trafficking, forced labor, and sexual abuse. For his unrelenting efforts in this space, as I think many of you know, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. So let us, let us hear from him in framing how it is that we can really tackle this current crisis with compassion, keeping the most vulnerable in mind. Uh, Mr. Satyati, over to you. Thank you, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, of course, we are all uh, passing through the most uh, unprecedented, the most extraordinary situation. And it is not simply uh, a health crisis or economic crisis. It's also a serious humanitarian crisis and development crisis. I can even go beyond seeing that it's also a crisis of civilization. Because the new normals, new priorities, new politics, new economy will shape a new kind of civilization. And I'm afraid that uh, the most marginalized and vulnerable sections of society must not be further marginalized and excluded and left out. We begin our morning with some of the most depressing and challenging news, as well as some of the promising and inspiring stories as well. Today, I think in two or ten places, about 15 migrant workers who were trying to return home were crushed by the trucks or met with some other accident and died. It is the situation of many people in many places across the world. When I I'm trying to speak on the issue of compassionate economy. I would begin with a very simple way of explaining it. And that is Mahatma Gandhi's talisman to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India. When asked by Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi said that if you are going to formulate or frame a policy or making any decision, make sure that 
the last person of society, the poorest of the poor you have ever seen in your life, should feel comfortable, should feel smiling, and be protected. So the economic policies and the political decisions must be guided and driven by the well-being of the last person of society. I'm not using compassion as a religious or spiritual connotation. It is something which is needed in politics, in society, in religions, and economy as well. It is not just sympathy to be sympathetic for others, neither it's empathy. Sympathy when you feel the suffering of others and have some concern. And empathy is much more deeper. That is feeling for the suffering of others as your own suffering. But the nucleus or the solution lies in compassion means when you feel the suffering of others as your own suffering, with a desire and drive to act to elevate that suffering, to end that suffering, makes you a compassionate person. And in terms of economy, if we are able to imbibe this value of compassion in making our economic decisions now, it will, it will not only help in addressing the humanitarian crisis and the crisis of civilization, but it will also help in ensuring that the inclusive development does not fall off track. I was the part of the discussions and negotiations while the sustainable development goals were being framed. And they are not simply the guiding principles. They are not simply the pieces of paper. They have a very strong resolve and commitment of the international community to sustain people, planet, prosperity, and peace altogether. And the most important is that it has two strong elements. One is the economic imperative of development. Means if you're going to invest in education, health, if you're going to invest in, uh, in stopping child marriages or violence against children, if you're going to address the problems of marginalized and indigenous people, then it has its own economic gain. So investment in development has a very clear economic gain and economic return. And the second important factor in SDGs is in a strong imperative of human rights. That was not the, the, the case in uh, uh, Millennium Development Goals. And when we talk of human rights, they are again not simply uh, some sort of uh, preaching or, or guiding principles. Uh, they are achievable goals. They are achievable commitments which we have made over the years and we have learned out of several disasters and difficulties and catastrophes to protect the human rights as uh, the part of humanity and dignity of human beings. So we have been working and raising this issue that the most marginalized sections of society and even in the world must not be left out in this crisis as well as the post COVID-19 uh, era. When we see in the newspapers about a few weeks ago, I was highly, highly anguished and I would say disturbed uh, while watching that a young girl, 12 year old girl, Jamilo, was walking on feet 150 kilometers from uh, Telangana to Chhattisgarh to return desperately to her home. She fell down and died on the spot. She was trafficked. She was held in bondage. She was working as child laborers in other state. And when she was returning, she had no money. We failed a child and we failed millions of children in the world now and also in the past. 
we are able, not able to ensure that children are not trafficked, children are not uh, held in slavery and, uh, and not uh, fall uh, out of schools uh, and become uh, wage earners in their early ages of 10 or 12. She died of hunger and thirst. This is not just one example. 16 people, 16 workers, daily, daily wage earners or migrant workers were returning and they were crushed by a running train on the railway track. We come across examples that how in the United States of America, one out of five children or one out of six children uh, are not able to get enough food in these situations. The food packets or the grocery and other facilities are not made available to those children. Uh, children and men and women with disabilities, or what we call a, a special abilities, across the globe are suffering quite a lot. Girls and women who were forced to uh, the, the flash trade or uh, commercial sexual exploitation, hundreds of thousands of them are now on roads and facing hunger and difficulties. There was a situation in, um, on the streets of uh, uh, Bangkok uh, when the government was uh, announcing some, uh, some uh, stipend or some uh, financial assistance to, assistance to uh, the daily wage earners and workers, uh, these women had no identity and no record, no registration, so they were suffering. We are also talking about uh, 300 million primary school going children who were highly dependent on uh, midday meal schemes, conditional cash transfer schemes. And these schemes were linked with, uh, with their attendance, school attendance. Their poor parents were highly dependent. So hundreds of millions of sub such parents and such children are facing serious crisis due to this situation. We all knew that we, if, we, if we invest $1 in education, then the return would be $20. We all know that when we spend $1 in eradication of child labor, then the return in uh, next 20 years would be $7. These are the researches done by the UNESCO, World Bank, and ILOs. So we have concrete data that every single of single year of schooling in the developing countries will help with, uh, uh, with an increase or will enhance the GDP by 0.34% a year. So if a child goes to school or every child of that country go to school uh, for 10 years, then the GDP growth would be almost 4% uh, 4 uh, higher than the existing. So these are strong economic imperatives and we are losing the sight from that. So dear friends, we uh, in our own uh, situations, uh, those who are helping people, uh, they must not forget that if we are not able to protect such vulnerable children across the globe, we are not going to protect humanity. We will not justice to ourselves and our generations. We are going to lose the entire generation if we are not going to put additional efforts in saving those children, their education, their health, and their well-being, their rights as well. Uh, I would, uh, uh, I would add here that uh, in uh, close cooperation and uh, association with a number of Nobel laureates, not from peace, but from all other disciplines, as well as uh, some of the moral leaders, including the former presidents and prime ministers um, and head of the states uh, in different parts of the world, are united to raise this uh, this, uh, this voice of uh, vulnerable children. And one of our core demands to the, to the countries as well as to uh, G20 that 
uh, the, 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 the five trillion dollars or five trillion plus dollars which are allocated uh, as the emergency fund now, 20% of it means 1 billion must go to the 20% people of the lowest strata of society. So 20% for those 20% people must be allocated. And this is good enough. Uh, this $1 trillion can save the lives of 10 million people in next two years. In next two years, it will help in or it will result in cancellation or equivalent to the cancellation of two years of uh, debt uh, for the most, uh, uh, for the least developing countries uh, or lower income countries. Uh, it will also be sufficient to fund two years of global gap to meet SDGs related to health and education, water and sanitation, this $1 trillion. So we are asking, we are demanding that this 20% of the money should go to 20% most marginalized people of the world. I hope that everybody would be able to do his or her bit, keeping in mind that these are all our children. Jamlo was our children. Children working in the mines in Sudan and uh, gold mines in uh, South Africa are our children. The children who are pushed on the streets are our children. The children who are locked um, and their employers have run away from premises, workplaces, factories and mines are our children. So we have to protect our children. There was a story which comes to my mind uh, in uh, half a minute is that there was a heavy fire broken out in jungle. All animals were rushing for a better place leaving the jungle, including King Lion. And Lion noticed that there was a tiny hummingbird rushing towards the fire. She was flying towards the fire. And surprisingly, Lion asked, what are you doing, committing suicide? She said, no, sir. I am going to extinguish this fire. How come he asked? And she replied, sir, I was born and grew up in this jungle. I'm not going to leave it like that. I am doing my bit. Dear sisters and brothers, do your bit for children. They are all our children. They are all our children. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Satyati. That was uh, incredibly inspiring. And uh, I know you have to jump off straight away and won't have time for Q&A, but if I could say one thing is to, you know, your message of uh, making sure our decisions are guided by the most vulnerable. To be able to do that, we need people who actually allow us uh, to, um, who actually allow us to know who the most vulnerable are. And for that, we need eternally vigilant uh, leaders. Uh, such as yourself. So thank you for being eternally vigilant and bringing these stories to us. Thank you, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who's joined us. Uh, we have a great set of uh, conversations ahead of us. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Satyati has to jump onto some calls uh, to actually push that message that he was giving to us with some world leaders. Uh, so it's time well spent. Um, what I, what, what I wanted to do now is just take you through the next 40 minutes. Uh, what we're going to do is share with you uh, some of the data that underpins what you just heard. So there's been a lot of great organizations that have been going out there into the field, trying to understand what's happening on the ground. How, how is this vulnerability being felt? And we want to shed a little bit of light on that. These are very live data sets, and it's not always easy to get that information out into the public, but we thought we'd use this forum to at least highlight a few things. And following that, uh, and really sort of completing out our first uh, plenary, uh, we have Anita Bhatia, the Deputy Director of UN Women, who I think is a perfect uh, sort of endpoint for this, really talking about one of the most vulnerable uh, parts of, of this equation, which are women, and the women and girls, and the need to, to take a gender lens, and how actually a gender lens can actually be a strong lever for us addressing these issues. 
so that's what's ahead of you in the next 40 minutes. I'm going to also invite uh, my colleague Shweta Totapali to join me, and we're going to go through a, a presentation now. Uh, now, I hope all of the tech work. I'm just about to share my screen, and let's see if this uh, starts to work. Okay, hopefully all of you can see that presentation. Great, I'm getting a, I'm getting a thumbs up. Um, one of the things that we uh, wanted to do is actually go through uh, various points of data around what low-income families are doing. But before we actually do that, um, I know that forums like this often feel like gilded towers and then we talk about what's happening on the ground. So let's actually get to know our audience a little bit, since we're going to talk about the impact of COVID from a financial perspective. We've actually created a little bit of a poll, which uh, people smarter than me on tech are going to put up right now. And let me know if I need to stop sharing my screen to allow that poll to happen. And this poll is really to understand this audience, and it's going to be very relevant to the conversation that we're going to have. Uh, so hopefully you can see that, uh, which is to just firstly, quickly, to understand which industry do you represent. Uh, we, do, we just want to understand who's, um, who's present. So let me give you about 15 seconds to answer that. Okay, great. If we could just get the next question. We want to know, since the lockdown started, how has your income changed? I, we're asking about the audience here. Okay, we'd like to know from you guys. Since the lockdown, you know, for whatever reason, has it increased a lot? Has it stayed the same? Has it decreased a little? Has it decreased a lot? I'd love to understand how's your personal income changed? Remember, this is all uh, uh, anonymous, so feel free to change. And the second question that's there is, since the lockdown, how has your daily spending changed? Has your spending increased, decreased? And certainly for me, it's decreased significantly. So just give you again a few, uh, a few seconds just to answer that question. And then we'll go through this uh, presentation. Okay, team, uh, whenever you feel like you've got enough responses, uh, we can keep that up and why don't we actually begin? So in terms of data from the field and highlights, you know, researchers across India are working to understand the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on poor families. And these are very important in a dynamic situation like the one we're in right now, because all of our assumptions from the last uh, set of uh, last decade have come to nothing as we suddenly deal with a new crisis with new kinds of behavior. You saw that with the huge amount of migration that's happening. And there's a great set of organizations uh, us included, but also lots of others, ID Insight, Jan Sahas, Indus Action, Gramwani, you name it, who are out there conducting phone surveys. Some of them are there on the ground trying to understand what is going on. And what we've tried to do over the next few slides is just give you a little bit of a window into, into that research. Message number one, and I want to really emphasize this because this is not about anecdotes and we'll go through the uh, data itself. The financial impact has been immediate and has been more severe than expected. And before I actually show you the data, I was wondering if our team can just share with everybody your survey results. So what you filled in in terms of the income loss that you experienced and the expenditure loss that you experienced. Okay. So if you, if you see that, uh, you can see that for the vast majority of you, it stayed the same. 
and over uh, around 80%, it's either stayed the same or decreased a little. Uh, if you actually go down to uh, what, what has happened on the expenses side, uh, again, for 80% of you, the expenses have actually gone down or gone down a lot. And if you actually look at those numbers and net them out, that actually means for many of you, especially of you for, for you who've, whose income has stayed the same, but your expenses have come down, through this crisis, you are actually saving money. Let's have a look at what's actually happening to BPL families, which is the bottom 50% of the country. By early April, the majority of households had lost incomes and jobs. Uh, and what we've done is pull together different surveys, not just our own, just to give you a sense of the range. So depending on the time when these surveys were done, but most of them uh, up till the middle of April, 47 to 67% reported that they had lost their jobs in low-income households. 84% of households witnessed a fall in monthly income during lockdown. Contrast that with us, where 55% of us saw no change. And 63% expect a loss in average monthly income of around uh, the average of, uh, are expecting a loss in average monthly income of which uh, that represents about 6,000 uh, 6, rupees if you uh, average it across. That's what's going on at the bottom 50% of households. And I think it's really worth uh, contrasting the experience of this lockdown with uh, what potentially is the top 10% or the top 5%, uh, where many of us have seen no change in income or a small uh, loss in income, but actually our expenses are also going down. And while the data is not there on, on this slide, if you actually look at the expense numbers that go against this, the things that poor households spend on are, is actually increasing in price. Uh, the, the basics, a uh, large percentage of the income is spent on food. That continues to uh, both be volatile and in general go up in price. So, the, so there's a double whammy there where you've had huge income losses, volatile prices, prices increasing, and contrasting that with a uh, uh, with many of us who are going through this crisis, uh, of course, feeling lots of challenges, but from an income perspective, in fact, coming out of it, coming out of it with increased savings. And this really is one of the new divides uh, that it, India is facing. One of the pieces of analysis we did was to figure out the duration with which households will run out of money. Again, I'm talking about the bottom 50% from an income perspective. And already when we conducted the survey uh, at the start of April, 18% uh, of households were reporting that they had zero savings in the bank. And about 70% they said they had enough for two weeks. And that's in the, by the end of the first week of uh, April. And we saw some of these numbers fluctuate and go up as we continue to ask our data. And we, we have a live uh, household survey going on that's reaching out to 50,000 households. And our own analysis suggests that every week uh, of this crisis, we're adding anywhere between three to four percent additional BPL families to the segment of zero cash, so already run out of resources. So now that it is, uh, we're into uh, the middle of May, it's anyone's guess how, how difficult the situation is. And we have a survey that will be coming out uh, next week uh, that will start to shed light on some of the latest data around this. So that's a, that's a little bit of the sort of the income impact that poor households are, are facing. And people are making drastic changes in their lifestyle. One of the things we did do is, aside from running a very large uh, survey, we also uh, conducted some very deep ethnographic uh, research to try and understand behaviors of people on the ground. Uh, People are changing uh, their eating patterns. Uh, people are skipping meals. Uh, that has a, obviously a, uh, an effect on productivity, which actually then lowers income. So you get into a cycle. These things are actually being felt uh, by people. Uh, there's no end in sight, given limited jobs. And so people are very concerned. And there's a big, big issue around migration that is happening to also essentially leading to oversupply of work, uh, sorry, oversupply of labor in what was already a limited 
um, labor set of conditions. So as we sort of think about migrant labor and, and helping migrant labor, and also recognizing that there is all these health concerns, people who are uh, receiving them in villages are also concerned about what that means for a local job situation, and often what that means for a gender balance perspective as well. Where a lot of Andrega work, which used to go to uh, women, uh, may now again shift. So these are some of the practical things people are feeling. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Shweta, who I'd say is the brains behind this very large survey that we're conducting to share what's actually happening from a government entitlements perspective. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Gaurav. And Gaurav did a really lovely job of sharing the depth of the financial impact that poor families are facing and really highlighting how important gov government entitlements are during this stretch. And what we're seeing from the data is that these entitlements are really providing an important lifeline for poor families. What we're also seeing is that there have been challenges with delivery that make it hard for some families to access and use their entitlements. Next slide, please. The good news is that 96% of low-income households are eligible for at least one entitlement. They're registered for either PDS and or cash. Uh, what that also means is that there's 4% of households that are actually not registered for anything, right? And so while 4% is a small number, it is still a significant number in a country as large as ours. And the thing that's really concerning about the 4% is that these are the people who actually have the hardest time proving who they are, who are already particularly vulnerable and already are probably not getting any help in the first place. And so I think a lot of the efforts that are underway to universalize coverage in certain states for, for ration, et cetera, are particularly timely and important. We then did a deep dive into two types of entitlements. One was PDS and the second was uh, cash. So when we looked at the PDS story, what we saw was that 84% of low-income households were registered for PDS. And about 80% of those are actually getting free or subsidized ration during this stretch. What that means is that you know, 15 to 20% of households are not able to get free ration or subsidized ration. And so the reasons that that's happening is because there are stockouts. And so people, still 15 to 20% of people are actually not able to get rations even though they are registered during a time where the need is perhaps higher than ever before. That of course does not even touch upon the quality of the food. Right? So if you look on the previous slide, um, what you see is that people are talking about the fact that they're getting wheat and that's helpful, but it's not actually sufficient. You know, they can't survive off of wheat, rice, and salt. They need pulses, they need vegetables, etc. Um, and we're also seeing other people talking about how even though they have many people listed on their ration cards, there are only some people in their families are actually getting it. And so this points to some of the implementation challenges with ration, as well as some of the scope issues in terms of what can our food system currently deliver to people. When you look at the cash story, we're seeing a similar percentage of households who are registered for at least one cash entitlement, and that's about 85% across the different schemes that the government uh, announced relief efforts under. And the good news is that the you know, households are getting on average about 1,100 rupees, and that's covering around 30 to 40% of their expenses on essentials during this time. However, what we've also seen is that about 60% of people have gotten their entitlements um, and report that they received their cash transfer in their bank accounts, but that means another 40% as of you know, mid-April had said that they had not yet received that amount in, in their accounts. And so there's some questions around you know, to what extent are people getting their transfers? Do they actually have the money in their account but don't actually know? What are the reasons that, you know, that they haven't actually said that, they, that the transfer has hit their account is something that we're, we're looking into. The other thing is that even if they've gotten the transfer, quite a lot of households are reporting difficulties in terms of withdrawing cash. The quotes on the right really illustrate the point pretty well. You know, one, the first talks about how hard it is to get to a bank that's three kilometers away. The crowding um, at banks is actually resulting in people not even trying to go in the first place, and even if they do go, right, what the one family articulated how it was so crowded that they actually turned away and were able to get nothing. And so in order for entitlements to be really useful during this time, it's really critical to think about how to address these last mile challenges and make sure that people not only get the transfers in the account, and, but they're also able to use them and use them to buy essential goods and supplies. So I think the implications in terms of, you know, what, what is the entitlement story telling us is that they're really helpful People really need them right now. It's providing an important lifeline 
but there's some important things that the that folks need to think about in terms of um, in terms of improving their efficacy. One is really thinking about enrollment efforts and you know how further to think about relaxing eligibility during this time. Two is really you know given what Gaurav said about the extent of the financial impact and the extreme distress that many families are facing. You know how to continue food um, and food delivery. You know even through things. Through PDS and ration, of course, but also through other solutions like community kitchens and make sure they're working and working really well so that anyone who needs food is able to get it. And number three, really to make sure to fix last mile challenges, both with ration but also with, 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 uh, with cash. Even with all the support that low income families are getting from the government, what we're seeing very quickly through the data is that very important vulnerable segments are still being left out. And this really hits home and personally, because as Gore mentioned earlier, you know, women and children are amongst those who are disproportionately affected. And I'll just give a few examples of, of how they're being affected. From a health perspective, 50% of parents with children under the, under the age of five years reported that they were having trouble getting access to immunizations for their children. From a well-being perspective, about 40% of parents reported that their children's mental well-being and happiness have suffered. From a security perspective, you know, the National Commission of Women reported a 50% increase over just the beginning of the lockdown period um, in terms of domestic violence complaints. And these are only the cases that have been reported and data from the past shows how underreported domestic violence complaints have always been. And the situation of the lockdown and just the realities of it mean that it's even that much harder to report during this time. From an education perspective, what we're seeing is that, you know, for 300 million students in India are currently out of school. Many of them actually do not have the digital means to learn online, like many of our children may have the ability to. And so these issues are really stark and show, you know, how impacted women and children are. Um, and I'd like to shed some light in, in terms of a few examples just to bring the point home. It's just stories from, uh, stories from people that we spoke with. What we're seeing is that, you know, all of this is happening while women are doing much, much more at home, but actually they have even far reduced access to essentials. Um, one gentleman actually framed this really well, where he shared with us, before the crisis, my wife and daughters used sanitary pads, but now we don't have the money. They've had to shift to cloth. So one of the things that we're seeing is that access to women's essentials have actually been overlooked during this time. Another woman, we have difficulty going outside to use a toilet used to go at 7 a.m. Now we have to go at 4 or 5 a.m. The police stop us even if we tell them. That's clearly a health issue. That's clearly a mental well-being issue. That's clearly a safety issue that feels like it's just being fully overlooked at, at this time and just highlights how vulnerable women are. Looking to another overlooked population, trans people and sex workers are one of the worst impacted and almost completely overlooked. And actually for them, they have little access to relief due to their identity. Here's one good example. We haven't received any government support yet. I've heard about the Jambin account, but I don't have one. I don't know anyone from the transgender community who has an account. And so this speaks to the 4% that I mentioned earlier, the people who are not registered for any government support during this time. And it speaks to how much more support that these individuals need when actually the entitlements are not reaching them at all. And I think the thing for me is that these stories really just represent the tip of the iceberg for vulnerable segments, women, children, trans people, sex workers, many others. There's a lot of other topics, right, that we haven't even touched upon. Time poverty that results due to the extreme amount of unpaid work that women are doing right now. Women's prospects of being able to return to the labor force when men are actually coming back and perhaps taking the jobs that they used to do. Girls' education, early childhood development, access to contraceptives, agency over ration and, and, uh, and cash that so many people have worked so hard to ensure, especially for women. All of these things feel like they're being overlooked during this time. And the thing is that these topics and these people deserve attention and they deserve support. And as a starting point, we need better data. So I've given a lot of stories, but we actually don't even have a lot of the data on these topics. And so the research community needs to galvanize around that. But equally, we actually need political will and money in order to translate those insights to action. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to, to introduce Anita, who will be speaking about how we can actually bring a gender lens to a lot of the work that's underway in India. Thanks, Shweta, and thanks for that uh, presentation. I think it makes a very strong point on how 
given the dynamic situation we're in and to remain, uh, as, as Mr. Satyati said, eternally vigilant around these things, we actually need to understand these vulnerabilities much better and the data is needed. And I think it's a great segue to bring in Anita Bhatti. Anita is the Deputy Director of uh, UN Women uh, and she has had a long history in championing important causes, especially around uh, gender. Uh, you know, she's been an influential thought leader in the gendered response to COVID globally, uh, describing, I think in her words, how to build back better by smashing the stereotypes around uh, gender roles. Uh, one thing she asked me to, when I asked her, what's the most important thing to know about you? Uh, she said, the most important thing to know about you is, about me is that I'm from Calcutta. So I think that says everything. So let me uh, now turn it over to Anita to take us through this. Can you hear me? Yep, you're loud and clear. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so look, first of all, thank you very much. It's great to be with all of you. Uh, great to have caught the last portion of um, Mr. Satyarthi's um, very inspiring, as you said, Gora, very inspiring speech. And thank you for that presentation, uh, Shweta. It had a number of really interesting uh, data points in it. Uh, maybe I'll just start off by saying that uh, I think having come this far in the crisis, we're now several months into it in the U.S., um, I think it is really a very good time to just stop and think for a little bit about what this crisis is teaching us. And one of the things that I think it's teaching us is that governments worldwide and societies worldwide have not actually invested in those systems and processes and um, investments in health, in social safety nets, in social protection systems, um, that would enable us to actually fight a crisis of this magnitude better. Um, you know, the, the human race is odd in that we often know about risks and then we don't actually act on them. And when I look at what is happening to women uh, worldwide, it really it worries me because, um, you know, there is still such a large gap to be addressed in terms of reaching gender equality. And we had those gaps and the issues even before the pandemic hit. And now that the pandemic has hit, these issues have been thrown into really sharp relief. And what do I mean by that? So there are a couple of ways to think about this problem. The first and foremost, I think, is actually, is there a gender lens on decision-making having to do with the pandemic? first and foremost. And, you know, women simply do not have a seat at the table. So when you turn on the television and you watch who's talking about the crisis and how it is being handled, by and large, these are men talking. And yet when you look at the impact of the pandemic and who it's affecting disproportionately, women and vulnerable groups, as Shweta's presentation showed, are right up there among those who are most affected. Now, of course, it's true that men are dying at higher rates than women from the actual public health emergency. But when you look at a series of different kinds of impacts, I think it's fair to say that women are actually uh, in some ways bearing the brunt of this disease not from a mortality perspective, but from the perspective of at least four other issues. First and foremost, in terms of the frontline workers, most of them are women. Frontline workers, I think 70% of social sector workers worldwide are women. And when you look at nurses, actually 92% of nurses globally are women. So the people who get infected are by and large are frontline workers because they are dealing with contagion every day, and many of these are women. Number two, when you look at the burden of care. So even before the crisis, women um, did three times as much unpaid care as men. Now, with the crisis, women are carrying an even big and bigger burden on unpaid care. And this is really not just a question of 
uh, something that can be solved at the household level, this is actually a question of public policy because there need to be policies in place that allow women to contribute to the workforce in the way that men do, but they can't because if you're at home taking care not just of your own work, but also of the children, the schooling, the housework. We've just seen this absolutely and completely magnified during the crisis. So in terms of data, it would be really interesting to think about has the burden of care that women are carrying gone up four times, five times, six times? I don't know what the numbers are, but as you think about what data to collect, this would be one really key uh, issue because what that means is that if women are carrying such a disproportionate burden of care, they're not actually going to go back into the workforce in the same way. So this actually has longer term impacts on female labor force participation. The third thing, and then I'll conclude shortly after that, the third thing that this pandemic is really throwing into sharp relief is that there is a shadow pandemic on the side which is the pandemic of domestic violence. This has always been a big issue um, in, you know, and it's not unique to India, uh, unfortunately, but the pandemic has shown us that, you know, when you create conditions for managing the pandemic, perversely, the very conditions that you need to manage the crisis, which is lockdown, restrictions on freedom of movement, uh, are the, same conditions that make it easier for abusers to unleash domestic violence. So we have seen this globally. We've seen it in Australia where the prime minister came out and talked about the fact that there had been a 75% increase in searches online regarding uh, help for domestic violence. We saw it in France where the government had to book 20,000 hotel rooms to make sure uh, that there was enough space for women who were victims of domestic violence to go to, to escape their abusers. We've seen, as Shweta showed in her presentation, an increase, a 50% increase in the number of calls reported by the National Commission on the Status of Women uh, just in a one month period in India. So, um, you know, it is really important for governments to think about this and to have public policy that is responsive to this shadow pandemic. And then finally, when you look at the impact of women uh, as of the crisis on women as economic actors, what you are seeing is that whether it's in the formal sector, but even more importantly, in the informal sector, women are um, going to be severely affected for years to come because they've lost jobs, they are um, unable to even eat, uh, you know, so we're really looking at basic needs like food. Um, and so governments have to ramp up big time in terms of social protection systems, social safety nets, uh, as well as, um, you know, food distribution and rations. I saw that today the finance minister in India announced a second booster shot. Uh, this is very welcome, but the question I would have is, is it enough? And how much more needs to be done to actually prop up uh, people, jobs, um, and communities to manage this crisis? Let me stop there. I've talked for a while. Uh, I'd love to engage with your uh, with the audience. Anita, thanks so much, and, and and again for for that sort of very strong perspective. Also, some very practical views on what kind of data we need to to actually get this conversation uh, moving. Uh, I, I'm going to pick one thing uh, because the gender violence thing has come up several times. There was a mm -hmm. bunch of people who brought it up in 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 the gender vertical as well today, and I guess the question I would have is: everyone talks about the fact that because we're all uh, in close together and there, you know, the violence has gone up and women then need to find these shelters. Can we flip the situation? I mean, if, if people are facing gender violence at home, should we be sending the men out instead of the women? Yeah, um, I like that idea a lot. And it's actually come up in a couple of conversations I've had on this issue. Um, I do think the response thus far has been, let's make sure that shelters are declared essential services and that we keep hotlines open. 
And I think all that is important, but I actually am beginning to think more and more that the issue is that we take the perpetrators of the violence out of the home environment uh, and um, move them off site, um, you know, and isolate uh, the victims, but give the victims the comfort and the relative security of their home rather than let the perpetrator enjoy those, those privileges and those benefits. Yeah, no, I think it would be really interesting if we can actually flip that conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, th one thing that I'm picking up in the questions, and I, you know, we have questions coming in from very different formats, so mm -hmm. I won't mm -hmm. be able to pick one. Uh, is this uh, idea of, you know, the con one of the hopes here is that there's a reset. Everything mm -hmm. is being reset. People are having new conversations. There mm -hmm. is a, governments are rethinking policies. Is there an opportunity here? I know many of the metrics feel like they're getting worse, but mm -hmm. is there an opportunity to embed gender lens into the thinking from, a, from the foundation itself rather than trying to push it into places it never was? Mm -hmm. So do we, is, there a, is there a silver lining here that you can think of and that you might be seeing? Um, they could be. I think it needs first and foremost to have women at the table. So this point on women's engagement and decision making and women being actually asked what should be done is really important. I mean, so I think a clear recommendation from our side would be to make sure that whatever structures, systems and processes are being set up to manage the crisis, right, have to have women, women at the table right, in a very intentional way. Now, we've seen that a lot of countries that have done really well in the crisis happen coincidentally to be run by women, right? Um, and, you know, there are, when you look at decision making, just not enough women at the table. So I had asked my team, give me a sense of how many health ministers today are women. And out of the 193 countries in the world, there's something like only 40 ministers of health are women. Um, and, you know, there, while there are no silver bullets, you can be sure that there are a number of issues that are just not going to occur to a man. So, um, you know, which is not to say that there aren't enlightened policymakers who are men, but I think for a number of really important issues, you do need to have a gender lens brought in. Uh, not saying that it can be done only by men, but I think you need women at the table in all decision making, whether it's on health, on finance and uh, planning. Um, when you look at planning ministries, out of 190, I think 70 ministers are uh, men, uh, sorry, are women. And when you look at finance ministers worldwide, out of 193, only 25 are women. And so I think we need to push for more decision makers being women. And even if they're not holding cabinet positions, as we set up structures to think through this, let's make sure women's groups are part of these structures and that women's organizations are part of these structures because they understand issues and will uh, be able to bring um, the intelligence of women as problem solvers and decision makers to the table. I think in terms of the silver lining, building back better is going to first, and that's why I insist so much on this point, uh, you need a gender lens. But then the second thing, I think is that's really important is none of these issues are new. We have known about a lot of these issues for a long time. What has been missing is the focus on implementation and execution and actually carrying through. So, you know, we don't actually need new diagnoses. We need new data to show, you know, how deep the problem is, how wide the problem is, how the problem may have changed and how much bigger some problems have become. But even before the crisis, we knew there was an issue on domestic violence, right? But there just hadn't been the political will and the appetite to invest to solve it. We knew there's an issue on unpaid care. It's just gotten a lot worse. So what are we going to do to actually shift that? We knew that we were not taking enough of a uh, climate lens on public policy. So we've now, you know, uh, we now know we need to do that better. So do we need new, dramatically different sets of public policies? Probably in a couple of areas, but for a lot of issues, it is simply focusing on implementation and execution of known policy prescriptions that I think is the issue. And that means 
political will. It means resource allocation to the right things. And it actually means very hard, difficult strategic choices and trade-offs. Just one example, when you look at what governments spend on defense, right? When you think about the fact that most governments' GDPs are going to shrink, the pie is going to become smaller, are you going to be able to allocate to public health sufficiently if you continue to have the same expenditure on defense? I don't think so. So I actually think you're going to have to make some very hard choices about where you, to what proportion of your shrinking GDP pie are you going to put towards the issues that we need to invest in to build back better? That's a great perspective, but I think also what would be really helpful, because you have an audience here who are doers. You have an audience uh, both, you know, working really at the grassroots to policy. One thing that well, I think equip them is a sense of who does it well, the ability to actually point to a few people, role models, Who's, who's taking leadership today that's really exercising exactly what you're describing, taking a gender lens and making smart decisions? Because that can really open up conversations at the ground level, you know, when you're facing yeah. down policymaker and so forth. So, look, I think a lot of self-help groups have done a tremendous job in raising awareness and in bringing issues to the fore. Uh, we need to invest in them. I, so I think we need a space at the table for self-help groups. And we need to just make sure that these are supported because many of them are really hurting very badly. And we need to drive public funding as well as private philanthropic funding to self-help groups. So the, I think those are groups that are doing a lot. Second, I think, as I said before, I think women's groups are really important. But also in terms of vulnerabilities, you know, we cannot leave anyone behind. So I think we do have to focus on groups that are bringing to the fore issues on LGBTQI, as well as uh, people working on disability and making sure that we are being really inclusive and thinking about the needs of uh, many, many vulnerable groups who are going to be left behind. So I think there's a role for public policy, but there's also a role for the self-help groups and uh, organizations to continue to make their voices um, heard. Right, and I, I know we're out of time. I think one thing I would just ref uh, also share as a reflection is, I do think there's also an opportunity to just have a changed conversation overall. I think, I think there is a changed conversation on how much do we care about GDP versus the growth versus the quality of that GDP. And that also means actually bringing women into the calculation of GDP, right? The, the, the whole missing work, the unrecognized work that happens that isn't recognized. I think, you know, we're going through a reset in terms of just even thinking about what are priorities for what is a good life. And I think there will be space for those kind of conversations. And it's great to have leaders like you sort of push that. So thanks so much. It's a real privilege for me to be able to close out this session. But Anita, thank you so much for joining us. You're dialing in from uh, New York or DC or something? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you thanks so time. much, Gaurav. Thanks uh, to, to you and thanks to your uh, very interactive and engaged audience for, uh, for this uh, opportunity to engage with you all. Thanks very much. Thanks, Anita. And with that, yep. uh, we are going to bring now. today's plenary uh, to a close. It's a privilege to do that. You guys have been involved in multiple, I think there were 16 tracks. And so it was fantastic for us to be able to uh, have the last plenary of today be about vulnerability because a lot of uh, the discussions today surfaced these emerging uh, vulnerabilities and what a great lineup. So thank you for engaging. And I'm going to hand it back to Lakshmi with, I think, some important announcements. What's, what's in store for us tomorrow as well? Thank you, Gaurav and Shweta, for sharing um, the findings of your ongoing survey and Anita for your insights. Um, I guess uh, it is uh, an evidence of how engaging the audience found it that I know in the Q&A, so many people have asked you to share the findings of your survey. So clearly, uh, this has posed a lot of questions to the audience, and that is really what one wants in a session. Uh, thank you for highlighting how deeply COVID has impacted the most vulnerable sections of our community, be it children, women, differently able, um, low-income households. Uh, I guess just extending what uh, Mr. Sityarthi mentioned, uh, the need of the hour is to make decisions, keeping uh, in mind these sections of the community, not just the poorest, but all of these sections of the community as we make decisions for the future. Um, but thank you everybody for being a part of this session. Um, 
I know it's been a very uh, eventful day. We've had over 100 speakers across multiple sessions and tracks. So um, I, can, um, I can imagine you are fairly exhausted. So I will not keep you uh, up for much longer, but I, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank our partners. Um, putting this huge event together would not have been possible without the contribution and support of people, uh, partners who came together in a very short period of time. So uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, too many to name individually, but thank you so much. We wouldn't have been able to pull this off without your support and encouragement. Uh, what's up ahead? We have a very packed day ahead tomorrow. Uh, we start at 9 a.m. sharp with a plenary session on uh, the role of foundations uh, in India's development journey. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you there uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so let me say goodbye. Um, take care. And bye-bye.